our last lectureship dealt to a great extent with the matter of fellowship. For whatever my opinion is worth regarding troubles in the brotherhood today, and there are many because we are so far removed from the New Testament teaching and pattern and the authority of it, and so much moved the other direction on emotions and likes and dislikes and personalities and whatever else is our favorite whatevers, that that is fellowship is one of the, biblical fellowship is one of the most neglected that I've ever seen in my lifetime for whatever, as I say, that's worth. I think if you know anything about the congregations of God's people, that you recognize just how far astray so many of them have gone. And yet because each church is autonomous, that is, each church runs its own affairs, then some are further than others. Some have different problems than others. But all of it centers around the authority of Jesus Christ manifest in the New Testament and doing only what he has authorized, leaving undone what's not authorized and what is expressly forbidden. There's just no other way to be sure, number one, that you are a Christian or that you're living faithful in all things to the Lord and his church unless you recognize that the New Testament is the final authority in all things. There's no way you can know who to fellowship and who not. Now you say, what about secret sins? Well, of course, we as humans, in our finite knowledge, we can't know everything about everybody. We wouldn't know about, and probably they wouldn't have known about it in the first century. That is, the sin of Ananias Sapphira, if it hadn't been revealed to them. That is, by the Holy Spirit to Peter. So we're not talking about secret sins. We're talking about what people are doing openly because that's what they want to do, and they're claiming it's all right. I received an inquiry on Friday from a young preacher. I don't know him. But uh, they were using women in leadership capacities, teaching when men were present in their vacation Bible school, and the elders were defending it because they were not in worship. Now, there would have been a time in the church when that wouldn't have been tolerated one moment by anybody. And it's been even in my lifetime. But that kind of thing is going on all over the place. Those elders have no more business being elders than does a turkey buzzard. Because they don't know the first thing about New Testament authority. Well, they wouldn't be having that when it comes to what the Bible teaches is the role of women in the church. They would be allowing it. But they are. So I never try to guess what's going to show up next. I mentioned at lunch that when our brethren go off base, they go off base more than when denominational people do because denominational people have a central headquarters in control and they have a catechism of some sort or creed and that holds them to making them whatever they are. The only exception I can think of that would be the community churches, and they're pretty well loose and run by one preacher, and they pretty much are all denominational. So it comes down then to a constant scriptural fight on the part of a remnant of God's people to keep the church the Lord's church, which means it belongs to Him. His will is to be done by members of the church. We wear His name. That brings it down to the organization of the church. And that brings it down to those men who God has put into the position of keeping the church like the Lord wants it. Paul said to the Ephesian elders as Luke records in Acts 20 and 28, and these are all familiar passages, starting to the, saying to the elders, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. So it begins with each elder taking heed to his own life. Then to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made them overseers, or made you overseers. Somebody may ask how that happens, and I just simply say when you meet the qualifications, the Holy Spirit's revealed in the New Testament of Christ, then He's made you overseers, just like when you submit to the plan of salvation, He's made you a Christian. To feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. If you go on over, you will find that Peter speaks of the same type of thing in 1 Peter 5. 
beginning with verse 1, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that should be revealed. Notice the same sentiment. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And he tells the reward then that awaits the faithful elders. When the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. If you go, of course, to passages like Hebrews 13, verse 7, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, that is, their manner of life, their conduct. And then verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable. I say fellowship is a problem. I don't know of anybody that's going to set this thing straight like the New Testament teaches. That is like the Lord teaches, except as under shepherds. You know what John wrote in 2 John 9, Whosoever transgresseth, American Standard 1901, said, Goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Now I could go on and read several other passages that bear upon the work of elders as shepherds. If you want to know something of that, then you need to study about the shepherd's relationship to the sheep. Read Psalm 23. And that's the concern that elders must have. Not that they ought to. Yes, they ought to. But if they're serving faithfully the elders, they have to know the sheep. Now later on, uh, I'm going to bring a lesson or so that's going to deal more with that kind of thing. In fact, I'm writing some stuff on it right now. As to what is involved in elders knowing the sheep they shepherd. And I suggest that's one of those cases where one ought to consider the whole lot of what the New Testament says concerning what it means for the elders to know the sheep so they can do their job. Because they're going to have to give an account to the Lord for everybody under uh, their shepherding someday. Now, I've preached umpteen lessons, and if you don't know what umpteen is, that's a lot, over 52 years, regarding elders, their qualification, their work, etc. But I've only been an elder for several months, and I preach it not only as my responsibility as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching the whole counsel of God, but also as an elder. I'm mindful of that personally. So these things uh, take on a rather personal thing to me uh, as to what I'm going to do when I give an account for those that I work with with the other elders, such as the spring congregation. It, it ought to be a, a, a knee trembling thing to realize that, uh, just think, you'll have to give account for Eric someday, for James someday, for everybody out there. So are the other elders. And it's going to be an account to Jesus Christ who already knows everything about all of it. Now, I say, I'm saying all of that, saying also that fellowship is one of our big problems today because people have left the Bible. They've ceased to respect New Testament authority. They're denying it's a divine pattern and so forth. John spoke, what was it, a week ago Wednesday night, John? He did not know that I was sitting there thinking, and yes, you are going to lay a good groundwork for what I've already intended. But I haven't told him that until right now. But he did. And of course, the time he had, he couldn't go into as much detail as I happen to know being a preacher without even asking him. He would like to have gone into more. <laughs> but I was thinking, I am. I'm going to go into more. <laughs> and I'm going to be called names. Because it all has to do with fellowship. It all has to do with informing you with what you need to know. Because I love you and want you to go to heaven. You know, I have no other reason to be standing here than that. If you can think of another reason I ought to be standing here, then you tell me. That's the only scriptural reason I know that I ought to be a preacher. And you need to know something. All things 
that you need to know aren't pleasant to know. A lot of things. We accept that in everyday life. But a lot of things you need to know aren't pleasant to know. But you need to know them. You all are aware of withdrawal of fellowship last fall of Jeff and, and uh, Carrie because of their fellowship practices and the time that the elders, and I wasn't one that time, but I was in on it as the preacher, that uh, they were working with them. It was all really centering around their son Hayden and his wedding and their participation with the congregation that is supporting things contrary to the teaching of the New Testament and trying our best to get some them to see why they shouldn't. I'll have to say that I'm quite sure that uh, Buddy and Ken, I know it was with me because I've known them longer than anybody in this room. I knew them for seven, nearly seven years at Austin. They just happened to, circumstance, move over here about a month after we moved here in 1993 due to jobs. But the truth of the matter is they simply don't believe the teaching of the New Testament on the limitations of fellowship. They just don't. Now I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Before I ever knew anything about what that was about with them and heard the pitiful defense, if you can call it a defense, that they made, the truth of the matter is, and this is just putting it bluntly, it came right down to this, we're going to defend our kids no matter what they do and that's it. Do you think that way? If you do, safe going to get you somewhere down the line. You're going to have to make the decision between somebody or something and which one comes first. And you'll have to apply Matthew 6.33. I wrote this because of another matter, but it was addressed to the Decker Prairie Church of Christ elders. I wrote it on January 7th, 2016, not 2017, 2016. I wrote it because I wanted to know I'm telling you right now, if you want to know something about a congregation and they have elders, don't go to your Aunt Sally or your best friend or Facebook. Go to where the buck stops. Go to the men who make policy. Go to the elders. So I wrote this email to the Decker Prairie Church of Christ elders. One question. Is this congregation an institutional church? Now, I define what I mean. Number one, by the previous question, I mean, do you support non-saints out of the church treasury? Number two, is it scriptural to eat in the church building? Number three, does the church support brotherhood orphan homes such as Bowles Home? Four, does the church believe in the, quote, sponsoring church, unquote, arrangement, where several churches send funds to one church to help support a work that the receiving church sponsors. An example of that is this congregation receives money from different individuals and churches because we're sponsoring Doug McClish. And then we send it to them. They think that's sin and you do it and you're bad shape. Now they split the church over this 65 years ago, thereabouts. They said if you believed that you could support non-Christians out of the church treasury, you're going to hell. And they did not mind at that time telling you that. One uh, of their brethren in Mississippi in a debate said, if you take one thin dime out of the church treasury to get milk for a starving baby, you'll lose your soul. He actually signed a proposition, not read just exactly like that, but actually signed that to be the case. Is it scriptural to eat in the church building? As I use the word anti, which means I'm against, then they are against it because they think it's sinful. Does the church support brotherhood orphan homes such as Bowles Home? I just use that as an example. There are other orphans' homes, other child care facilities. And I'm not talking about now if they've gone wrong in other areas. I'm talking about simply a child care facility to take care of those who are bereft of parents, which is the Greek word for orphanos. They say it is. One of the reasons they say it is, is well, in fact, there's two main reasons. One, you've got people in there who are non-Christian, and you're supporting them out of the church treasury. The other reason is, they say it's an institution, independent, separate, apart from the church, like the Missionary Society. And they're as confused on that to this day as they were when they started that business. The home never was the church. The church never was a home. 
The home has its job to do and the church has its job to do. When they came up with the Missionary Society in the 19th century, the Missionary Society was doing the work of the church. And when it got through doing its work, the church did not have the work to do. God commissioned the church to do. The home is simply doing the work of a home. And when mom and daddy are no longer there, but the children are there, James 1.27 comes to bear. And the church is expected to take care of those bereft of parents. However they became bereft of parents, they don't have them anymore. The natural home is gone. And listen, once the natural home is gone, it can't be restored. You can have, as it is said in legal parlance, in loco parentis, which means in the place of parents. And according to Romans 13, we're to obey the powers that be, civil powers. Now, if you want to find out what will happen to you, find a child on the street about 10 years old. It has no parents. It's wandering the street. And you just go take it into your home and say, I'll just be a good Christian. And you'll stay here from now on and we'll keep you and we'll raise you. See what local powers do to people like that. And you'll understand Romans 13 that we ought to obey them. So when they legislate on homes and how you take care of kids, then we obey them according to the instruction of the Lord. Unless they are legislating that which is contrary to the Lord's will, then we ought to obey God rather than men. So if you're going to have, quote, orphans' homes or child care facilities, they're going to have to meet the standards that legal uh, or laws say you must that regards those matters. So they said, no, you got another institution. No, you have in loco parentis abiding by the laws of the land when they don't violate God's will. In order for the church to perform, James 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The word visit from a Greek word that means provide for them what mom and daddy can't provide for them because mom and daddy aren't there. Or provide for the widow because what the husband ought to do, but the husband's not there. That's exactly what that means. And when you have institutions set up to take the place of the home, it's not taking the place of the church any more than this church contributing to, let's say, uh, non-members who lost their house in a fire and you contribute money to them to help them out. And I hope we would have enough of the milk of human kindness and concern to help somebody out that way that needed it. So, does the church believe in the sponsoring church arrangement where several churches send funds to one church to help support a work that is receiving church sponsors? Now, understand, I'm writing what elders of the church, whether they are, quote, anti or not, understand. But I spelled it out just in case they didn't. Okay, I look forward to your answers to the previous questions. Thank you ahead of time for answering them. Sincerely, David Brown. Okay, I got this back. Mike Moriarty, uh, he turns out to be, I believe, the preacher, but he cc'd their elders, and here's what he says. David, happy to answer your questions. Now watch. Can you please tell us where you worship now and why you ask? What difference does it make where I am, who I am, or where I'm worshiping? Just answer the question. You know, that's when I would love to be a lawyer in court to get some of my brethren so I could look at them and say, answer the question, and then have to. And that's what it'd take for some of them to answer it. Threat of being put in jail because they can figure out everything to say but the answer. Now this man's a preacher. He knows exactly what's up. Okay, sent that from his iPhone. I write back, hello Mike. I'm the preacher for the Spring Church of Christ. I've been told by others what the Decker Prairie congregation believes regarding some of the questions I ask in my first email to the Decker Prairie elders. It's a good time for thunder. However, I wanted to hear directly from those who shepherd the Decker Prairie congregation regarding the same. Therefore, I address my questions to said elders to have definite and accurate answers to said questions. Thanks, David Brown. Is that clear to you? You have any problem understanding that? All right. And it's not, I don't think, it's hateful, smart, elegy, arrogant, anything else. It's just language that can be understood, if you want to understand it. Okay, I get this back. David, we appreciate your coming to us directly to substantiate firsthand what you have heard from others. The answers to your questions are based upon our understanding of the scriptures and what authority God gives us. 
We use scriptures such as 1 Peter 4, 11, Hebrews 7, 14, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, 1 Corinthians 2, 19 through 13, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, among others, in order to determine what we have authority to do as the Lord's church and as individual members of his church. I've quoted just two of these. He quotes then 1 Peter 4, 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, etc. Then Hebrews 7, 14, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood, which is trying to say, and rightly so, if you don't have authority, you can't act. Based upon these and other scriptures, we can only practice what we're given authority to do by God. Let me pause here and say, has he answered any question yet? That authority may be in the form of a command, an approved apostolic example, or an escapable conclusion. I'm glad he told me that. Never heard of that in my life. Equ equally authoritative is the silence of the scriptures. Well, that's something new to me. When God has said nothing on a given practice based on Hebrews 7, if we can't find any mention of it, that means God has not given us the authority to practice it. Now, I know where he's heading because I know already what they are. And besides that, as I said to a fellow last week, when he was declaring that um, we couldn't have church buildings because they didn't have them back in there, I said they didn't have the Internet and they didn't have what you're writing on, but it's not stopping you from using that. To answer your question specifically, well, that's fine. That's the last paragraph. We can find no authority in the Bible for supporting non-saints out of the treasury, for providing a common meal at the church building from the treasury, for supporting all from homes out of the treasury, or for the sponsoring church arrangement. So we do not practice those things. In Christ, Mike Moriarty on behalf of the elders of the deck of prayer. Hey, we got our answer. If we don't, we'll see a little further. Now, he doesn't go into why. I'm not asking him why. I just want him to ask, do you or don't you? His brother Wallace used to say in debate to his opponent, shake or nod. So I say, hello, Mike. Thank you very much for your forthright answers to my questions. Based on your answers to my previous specific questions to you, I have the following questions for you. They start that question business with me. They've opened a nice door. With all other things being scripturally equal, do you extend Christian fellowship, my bold Christian fellowship, to or are you in Christian fellowship, bold Christian fellowship, with any churches of Christ that, number one, support non-saints out of the church treasury. Two, provide a common meal at the church building out of funds from the church treasury. Three, provide a common meal at the church building paid for by the individual members. Four, support orphan homes out of the church treasury. Five, support orphan homes from individual church members' financial contributions. Six, and or practice the sponsoring church arrangement. Again, thanks for your answers. I look forward to your answers to the above questions. Cordially, David P. Brown. So he writes me back. David, if by fellowship, you mean active participation with? The answer is no. Sometimes fellowship is used of common kinship in Christ. The issue would be the extent of fellowship. We consider the members of those churches to be our brethren, but would not encourage Christians to participate in those groups because we believe they practice error corporately altogether. I realize your church supports those beliefs and do not, my church, and do not mean to offend you. I am just answering your question. I wish you would as straight as I can. I would prefer we not get into an extended email discussion. However, if you want to pursue this further, we could meet in person. Mike, I, I want to pause here and say this. If this had been at least 40 years ago, they would have already challenged me to a debate, and they would answer me clearly that we were wrong and going to lose our soul if we didn't repent. Now, anybody that knows the history of the church on antiism knows exactly what those guys debated. There are too many debates out there, too many of them that made it very clear you folks are doing things that's contrary to the Bible, and you're going to lose your soul over it. We can't fellowship you, and you must repent, and we're ready to debate. Have you heard anything like that so far? Somebody's doing some changing. All right, so I write him back. I say, Mike, you are not offending me. I would be glad to visit you uh, with you about these matters. Truly, I'm attempting to find out if you believe that the spring congregation is faithful to the Lord regarding our practice of said matters wherein we differ. If we are unfaithful to Jesus, we will not be able on the day of judgment to hear from our Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. Will a Christian lose his soul if he practices regarding said matters what we do concerning them? 
But if you say that by the spring congregation practicing that about which my questions were concerned, we are lost, then that means you think we are out of fellowship with God. We both know no one can go to heaven when one dies out of fellowship with God. And if you believe that about us regarding our practice of said matters, then we could not fellowship you. And certainly your beliefs regarding the same would not permit you to fellowship us. You used to have no problem getting them to say that. They won't say that so fast, make your head swim. You also know as well as I do that about 60 years ago, the Lord's church divided over these matters and we remain divided today. All I'm attempting to find out is this. Do you believe, as did Roy Cogdell, Yader Tant, at Al, regarding those of us who practice said matters? Those said brethren and all who believe then and present believe as they did had no problem saying that churches of Christ who practiced regarding said matters what spring does today were lost because we practiced them. Moreover, they made it plain that regarding said matters, that we were no different than those erring brethren of the 19th century who advocated the missionary society and who moved the mechanical instruments of music into the worship of the Lord. Thus, they taught we are lost and practicing the same as my questions are concerned. It should not be any more difficult for you to say what you believe about said matters than it was for Cogdell, Tant, and many of your brethren who continue to say about the same today. I too do not mean by my plainness to offend you needlessly, but you either think we are separated from God by practicing what we do regarding these matters and are lost, or you don't. I have told you my position regarding the same, and I only desire you to state your view as I have stated mine. I thank you for dealing with me. However, I do think that before we discuss this, uh, discuss face to face these matters, that I should know what you believe about the spring congregation's relationship to God regarding our practice of said matters. Let me know what you would like to do in discussing said matters as you suggested in your last email. Please know that I have no ill will toward you or the Decapri congregation in pursuing this. I really did not know firsthand what you all believed regarding said matters. Thus. I wanted to get definite and plain answers from the elders so that I could have direct and accurate information regarding where you stand concerning these matters. Thank you very much. Signed it. Why don't I get this back? David, it is not the elders at Decker Prairie's position to render final judgment about this matter upon all individuals who practice these things. That is in God's hands. What is that? Can I know what Paul knew when I read and understand what Paul wrote? Does, he, does this Bible address anything as to fellowship, who's in and who's out? All right, let me read further. If you can provide scriptures to substantiate your beliefs on these issues, you have itemized. As we have, we will consider this matter further. I'm not averse to doing that. But it's like Brother Hardiman said years ago. You can write uh, and ask us, Har a Freed Hardiman College's position, on anything, and I can answer you at that time on the back of a penny postcard and still have room to say, how's your Aunt Tilda? This business of not being able to say yay or nay is kind of interesting. All right, so he goes on. Unless you can prove otherwise, the issue is simply that these practices are not supported by Bible authority, and thus we do not practice them nor encourage anyone else to practice them out of concern for their souls. Why? They don't even know we're lost or saved. They won't even answer it. Those with divisive attitudes, some way they always get around to that. On either side, well, why aren't we together? Why was there ever a division anyway 60 years ago? Those with divisive attitudes on either side of those issues could very well be lost. But again, God would judge all that. Is he telling me Annie's and... What we are must all wait to judgment to find out. Our consciences would not allow us to personally participate in your group because we would be knowingly participating in what we do not believe the Bible authorizes. You know, he mixes up consciences there. I can do, I cannot do a lot of things or do things because of my conscience. That has nothing to do, according to the Bible, with it being actually right or wrong. I want to know what's right or wrong. I want you to tell me whether I'm faithful to God. He will not come out and say that you are lost. Folks, if I do something contrary to the authority of the New Testament, am I faithful to the Lord? If I'm not faithful to the Lord and I die that way, am I going to heaven? If I am, I miss the boat. 
for over 50 years of preaching the gospel and what the unity of the church is all about and how it's attained, even when I become a Christian and how I know when I became a Christian. Now, Jeff and Carrie placed membership there. Now you figure that out, folks. They can have fellowship with the church whose policy divided the church 60 years ago, binding where God has not bound in His Word. But they can't have fellowship with us because they would have to go against kids and where they were going because they were fellowshiping with people they shouldn't. You're talking about a witch's brew and a wash pot. This is it. I told you earlier, fellowship's one of the things. These folks, Carrie and Jeff included, don't know how to begin to determine. Well, I don't know really what they know. I'd rather really say they just choose and pick as it suits wherever they are at that time. Now you say, you're being awful tough on them. I didn't place membership at any church that won't even tell me that I'm lost, though they tell me I'm practicing things not authorized by the New Testament and they're not faithful in the doing of it. What you've got among the Annies nowadays, you've got some that are just as strict as they were in 1960. They don't mind telling you if you do these things, you're lost. On the other hand, you've got some of them out there that hold on to those basic tenets like these people at Decker Prairie, but they're loosening up on about everything else, and they don't want their old line Annies to know it because if they start loosening up too much, they got to answer to the group that they're most associated in the fellowship with, and they just don't do it. And if you can... If you can go be a part of something like that, all because the Spring Church won't fellowship people who are fellowshipping those that we shouldn't fellowship. Something is bad wrong in somebody's mind. When we deal with matters, we ought not mince words. Anybody that wants to know more specifics about matters, you want an example of how to find out? I'll give you a copy of my email how to find out specifically from the people who make the policy exactly if they'll tell you what to find out. If I want to find out about J.D., I ought to go to J.D., had I? Maybe I ought to go to his wife. I don't know. You know, in the Lord, Paul, by the Spirit, from the Lord, explained how we got the Bible. He said, we got it by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, so He knows the things of God. And His part in the Godhead is to reveal God, so He's the one that revealed God because He is God. And then He says, what does man know? Or what a man knoweth, he is, the man knows it from within himself. That is, if you want to know, if I want to know what Jed uh, thinks about something, assuming he knows something about it in the first place, <laughs> Shouldn't ask yet. The churches of Christ today are splintered to pieces. The congregations may have Church of Christ above the door, but until you go talk to the people who make policy as to what they believe and what they practice, you're taking your soul's eternal destiny in your own hands to march in there and become a part of it and say everything's all right because I got away from the folks I didn't like in the first place. And that's just where a whole lot of it is. Do you know why ultimately and finally you are here where you are today? Do you know why if you're married, you married the person you married? You wanted to. We are blessed by God with free will. But God says, you can have it. And I'll appeal to you through my revealed word. There'll be proof enough to show you it's from me and not from man. Or you can go on the basis of the appetites of the flesh. Less of the flesh, less of the eyes of pride of life. And you can make your choices that way. But at the end of time, you're going to stand before me and give an account of every action done in the body. And the elders of the church are going to give an account of those they superintended and shepherded for the way they lived. 
Does that not say somebody ought to be a little bit on the reverential awe and somewhat fearful lest we fall into the hands, as the Hebrews writer said, of a living God who is a consuming fire? Christianity is no plaything. There is nothing more serious or sobering than to approach God Almighty. And the only way a man can today, scripturally, and that is as the Bible directs. You don't play at being a Christian. The churches of Christ have become so lax. I promise you in most churches, if I preach this sermon, as it affected another church the way this has here with the people we know, I probably wouldn't be there in short order. But it's the truth. And the truth will make you free. And just because we become lax ourselves and slip and slid along doesn't mean we can't take up the slack and be what God says we ought to be. There's not a thing this Bible God obligates us to do that we can't do. Not a thing. If it's not done, it's because we choose not to do it. So I'm asking you to think more seriously than ever about your life and about God, about the study of the Bible, about its application to your life, about who you choose and why you choose and the reason you choose. Because someday, it won't be me standing here. I'll be out there with the rest of you. But we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And the elders will have to give an account for everybody they eldered. Thus, that tells me now, not just preaching as a preacher, but as an elder, I want to know your business. Because I don't want you by any hypocrisy and secrecy to drag me to torment with you. You may not think that much of your soul. I'm speaking generalities here. But I think that much of my soul. But what is it, it profited if a man gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You better answer that question. It's sad. It's horrendous. That people like Terry and Jeff Barnett have done what they've done. But they're just one among many. And it's so sad. You know, people, well, our little girl, our little boy. Everybody has been somebody's little girl, little boy. Somebody, when he was probably about one year old, sat with Adolf Hitler on the lap and dawdled him and picked at him and cuckooed him. Don't let your emotions cause you to break God's will in dealing with people. There is one supreme, supreme ruler that has my love more than anybody else, and I just wish it was stronger. That's God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. I love my wife. I love Jesus Christ more because by loving Him more, I learn better how to love her. That's the same toward a husband, same toward your children. We just got the cart for the horse. We go too much on this emotional business and touchy-feely and my way. And thus we fall victim. See, you just don't have to, and I'll close with this, you don't have to go out here and teach that one doesn't have to be baptized, but they'll be saved. Or you don't have to say, oh, it's not, you don't have to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week in the assembly of the saints. You can take it whenever you want to. Those aren't the only things that will cause you to lose your soul. And fellowship is one of those things that's in the Bible, if I understand it at all, is there a serious matter? Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If anybody comes to you and brings not this doctrine, don't you even receive him into your house and don't give him God's speed. Any encouragement. He that biddeth him God's speed. See, you may not even believe or do what he does. But if you give him encouragement, you are partaker. That's fellowship in his evil deed. Is that serious? If it's not serious, how would he have to write it to be serious? And what does that say to you and to me about how we deal with things? These people know better how to answer questions. They can answer that question in the very response I first made as to yes or no. I wouldn't ask them to go into a whole line of reasoning on it. I just want to know, do you believe it? Ask 
Ask me, do you believe you must be a member of the church of Christ as that term is used and defined in the Bible in order to go to heaven? You absolutely must. And now you want to know why I believe that? Then we'll have to sit in a Bible study. We'll study you and find out why I believe it that way. You see, even in the churches, we fight rank liberalism elsewhere. We, uh, we let it sort of slip, slip into us who think we're so right down the line in the straight and narrow. The Lord said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. He never did say, well, beat around the bush about it. Now I close saying, if you're not a Christian, there's only one way, one single solitary way for you to become a child of God, a member of the church, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, to be forgiven of your sins. And that is on the basis of the testimony and evidence in the scriptures to be brought to a belief in Christ. Romans 10, 17, John 8, 24. To repent of your sins of which you're commanded to do, Acts 17, 30. To confess your faith in the Christ, Romans 10, 10. Now you're qualified to be baptized, immersed in water, by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. And if you won't do that, you can't go to heaven. That's the Lord's teaching. Who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now there we can say the same thing. Once you become a member of the church. About any obligatory matter. That one must. And that's what we're saying when we say obligatory must. Do or not do in order to remain faithful in the church of our Lord. And fellowshipping people who are not in fellowship with God will put you where they're going to be when you die. If not, I guess we do like Paul quoted some of the Romans. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. If you need to repent of your sins as a child of God, confess them and pray to God for forgiveness. Then we offer you this invitation at this time while we stand and sing.